Watch this. So the Boise police chief resigned after being accused of creating a hostile work environment within the department. End of story, right? Well, not yet. There now seems to be a question of confidence in city leadership. What also isn't so clear, interpretations of Idaho's recent abortion laws. The state's universities are now extending their enforcement where even a suggestion of emergency contraception by their employees is outlawed. The general election, still about six weeks out, but absentee ballots are already hitting our mailboxes. And one question on that ballot has some voters questioning its actual intent. The city of Boise has a new acting police chief. Longtime BPD officer Ron Weininger was made acting chief today in the fallout of Boise Mayor Lauren McLean asking Chief Ryan Lee to resign. That request came, or from the mayor, came about 24 hours after KTVB investigative reporter Alex Duggan published her investigation into claims of a hostile workplace under Chief Lee. Officers detailed to KTVB a culture of name-calling, put-downs, and overall low morale at BPD. An environment, officers say, led to the departure of several longtime BPD officers. Well, today, Boise City Council met for the first time since Chief Lee's resignation, and Joe Paris was there where I believe this topic had to come up, right? Because this isn't situation a situation where it's just kind of over and done with going forward. Well, it came up, uh, but it only came up in executive session. So there's mm. the, the public part of the meeting, which we were there for. They mentioned that they were going to go into executive session to talk about a personnel matter. You can read between the lines on sure. probably what they were talking about there. But you know, just because Chief Lee is going to be leaving the department in October doesn't mean this is over. And there are serious situations and claims that still need to be investigated. And we're talking in terms of the actual environment at BPD and the claims of a hostile working environment, but also how those claims were handled at the city level. And city council did go into their executive session to discuss a personnel matter. Of course, they couldn't elaborate beyond that. But again, reading between the lines, we know there's a serious conversation to be had between city leaders and the city council about exactly what happened and could happen in the future at Boise Police. But only they can say for sure, those that were in the executive session. We did ask members of city council to talk with us about moving forward and the inventory they now need to take on Boise Police and human resource processes. And council member Jimmy Halliburton told us today that he was surprised to see the news yesterday after he was away this weekend. But Halliburton did tout a positive relationship that he had with Lee. He adds to us, though, that he had not had any BPD employees reach out to him personally about issues they saw with the department or Chief Lee. But he says he can't speak for other members of the city council. So while city council works to learn more about the situation, Halliburton says it's a great time to take inventory of the much talked about human resources and accountability processes within the city of Boise and Boise police. You know, we have all these systems that are in place that are designed to help you do things the right way, to make sure that you, you know, honor an investigation, to make sure that you're not making decisions in an arbitrary or capricious way. And so I think we just want to make sure that if we've got systems, that those systems are working. And if those systems aren't working, that we can address, you know, where we need to make changes. And at this point, I really don't know um, what changes need to be made, if any, and just still trying to figure a lot of it out. Retired Boise police officers told our seven investigates team about how they were unsure how the investigation into their complaints about Chief Lee was handled by the city and the Office of Police Accountability. Now they put out a memo recommending that Chief Lee be placed on leave and that complaining officers be interviewed further, but neither of those things ever happened according to the officers we spoke with. Chief Lee was never placed on leave pending an investigation or placed on leave pending any criminal investigation into an allegation that he broke an officer's neck during a briefing. That incident resulted in no official charges. Well, why? Well, it's because a third party investigation was conducted by the mayor's office and found no violation of the policy. Mayor McLean told us that back on Friday. So in terms of moving forward, Council Member Halliburton gave a glowing recommendation for Ron Weiniger, who's now going to be the acting BPD chief. He's back in the department after leaving uh, a time ago. He was there for a long time, retired, now being brought back. But, I mean, there's still a lot to get into here, Brian. I think I've seen some impressions on social media and spoken to people in the community that say, okay, well, the chief's gone, it's time to move forward. And while that is true, there's still some very serious conversations about how was this handled, were there issues with this, and that's what an investigation and further work will have to determine. Well, I was going back and looking back what Halle Burton said to you, that, you know, if the system's in place, make sure it's working. It's not working. It didn't seem like it's working because, well, the mayor's office says no need for any sort of change. And then 
an investigative report comes out and all of a sudden there's a need for change. Yeah, so there's a lot of serious conversations that are still yet to, yet to be had. All right, thank you very much, Joe. Well, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Yes, I understand. That's how our judicial system works. If you don't like the outcome of your court case, you can appeal to another court. Well, former state lawmaker turned convicted rapist Aaron Von Ellinger is trying again, taking his conviction to the Idaho Supreme Court after being found guilty in April of raping a 19-year-old statehouse intern and then failing in his attempt for a new trial just last month. Try, try again. So, hoping to avoid his 20-year sentence that was handed down last month, Von Ellinger claims a few things went wrong in his original trial. The court let the nurse who treated Jane Doe testify to her state of mind during her sexual assault examination, he says. But under Idaho law, well, that is allowed. Nurses, they are allowed to testify to a victim's state of mind, among other things, in court. The appeal also says the judge should have declared a mistrial after Jane Doe left the stand during her testimony, not allowing a cross-examination. However, Von Ellinger's attorney was given that opportunity during the trial to request a mistrial, but his attorney adamantly declined. And finally, the appeal says the court abused its discretion in imposing a 20-year sentence. Well, that attorney that declined to discuss a mistrial during the actual trial, John Cox, well, he was representing Von Ellinger pro bono, meaning for free. But Von Ellinger has since filed for a new public defender. The appeal will be reviewed in the coming months. If time is indeed Frederick Nietzsche's flat circle, well, we are certainly circling back to a time before Idaho began, at least to a time before it became a state and when it was just a territory. About three weeks ago, we were alerted to a part of the outlawing abortions in Idaho that didn't get as much attention as, well, the actual banning of abortions during the statewide discussions. See, back in 2021, the legislature passed and Governor Little signed into law House Bill 2020. That bill made sure taxpayer dollars would not support the abortion industry by not allowing any state funds to go anywhere near abortion providers. It was called the No Public Funds for Abortion Act, appropriately, and it went into effect May 10th, 2021. It would apply to every level of Idaho government, any state or county or city agency, any employee of those agencies, which also includes public schools. Within the language of the law, however, was the phrase abortion-related activities, what might that be, you might ask? Well, according to Boise State University, that means the No Public Funds for Abortion Act directly prevents the school from providing a number of services, including dispensing a drug classified as emergency contraception by the FDA, except in the case of rape. Meaning a college student who walks into the school's health services clinic asking for Plan B or the morning after pill, well, she can't get that anymore. In fact, anyone working at that clinic they couldn't even suggest where that woman could go to get such emergency contraception. They could talk about it in generalities, but not be specific for fear of promoting, referring, or providing facilities. Unless that woman walked into the clinic with a police report providing she was raped, or proving she was raped, I should say. That clarification was provided to us two weeks ago. But Boise State would not provide us, anyone, to speak with on camera nor would they provide any numbers as to how many students out of their 20,000 visits per year to the University Health Services Clinic over the last couple of years, how many actually received such services before the law went into effect. Neither reproductive health services nor emergency contraception. We were told this data is not collected or stored. And when we asked why isn't it, why isn't it tracked like maybe ibuprofen or flu shots would be, even for the sake of knowing when to order more, we received no response. So we don't know if this was a significant health clinic service provided at Boise State or not. Well, not to be outdone, and since this law applies to all state schools, the University of Idaho took the interpretation of this law one step further. Last week, late last week, a memo sent out by the U of I to all university employees began circulating. This email came from the school's general counsel, and the subject line is guidance on abortion laws. Basically, university employees, while on the job, could not promote abortion, provide an abortion, counsel in favor of an abortion, refer for an abortion, provide a place to have an abortion, or give out emergency contraception, except in a case of rape. Very much the same as Boise State's new directives. But there's a last line there that says, advertising or promoting services for abortion, or for the prevention, or for the prevention of conception. That's the step too far for a lot of people. 
On page five of page seven, or of the seven page memo, I should say, general counsel explains this a bit further. And they refer to Idaho code 18603, which states, a person other than a licensed physician or a licensed healthcare provider acting under a physician or under a physician's order who willfully publishes any notice or advertisement of any medicine or means for producing or facilitating a miscarriage or abortion or for the prevention of conception or who offers his services by any notice, advertisement, or otherwise to assist in the accomplishment of any such purpose is guilty of a felony. That's Idaho Code, 1816, 18603. The university admitted the language of this statute is not a model of clarity, adding the scope of what is meant by prevention of conception and to have offered services by notice, advertisement, or otherwise, well, that's unclear, and it's untested in court. Since violations are considered a felony, they say, we are advising a conservative approach here that the university not provide standard birth control itself. So, to avoid any confusion, or rather because it is so confusing, the University of Idaho and any of their employees, due to Idaho's recent abortion laws, will no longer be providing birth control to its students, like at all. However, they will provide condoms, that is. They're going to give out condoms only, though, to prevent the spread of STDs. That's it. And this seems like a good time to circle back to that time as a flat circle reference because the law the University of Idaho points to as their guidepost in their new direction, Idaho Code 18603, was originally passed in 1972, a year before Roe v. Wade. That law uses the exact same language as what was written in the revised statutes of Idaho territory enacted at the 14th session of the Legislative Assembly in force June 1st, 1887. You see on top, that's the 1972 law. On the bottom, that's the statute from 1887. Title VIII of Crimes Against the Person and Against Public Decency and Good Morals, the law says. Chapter 8, Section 6843. The 1972 law added the part about exempting licensed physicians, but it says, word for word, every person who willfully, and they even use the same single L spelling of willfully, Every person who willfully publishes any notice or advertisement of any medicine or means for producing or facilitating a miscarriage or abortion or for the prevention of conception or who offers his services by any notice, advertisement or otherwise to assist in the accomplishment of any such purpose is guilty of a felony. Word for word. So the state's land-grant university, the largest and leading research, research university in Idaho, is now using a statute written two years before it even existed in 1887 as guidance for birth control. When we asked the school to explain this broad understanding of the law, they wouldn't respond to the contraception question, but they did say this. The University of Idaho follows all laws, referring to no public funds for abortion act passed in 2021. This guidance, they said, was sent to help our employees understand the legal significance and possible actions of this new law, admitting the law does not specify what is meant by promoting abortion. They are certain university employees are paid with public funds. That they do know. So they added abortion can still be discussed as a policy issue in the classroom, but those discussions have to be neutral or risk violating the law. We support our students, they say, and our employees, as well as academic freedom, but understand the need to work within the laws set out by our state. And even if those laws were set out originally back in 1887. So what about Boise State? Will they no longer provide, will they no longer provide contraception to their students? We asked them that. They see this a bit differently, though. In a FAQ attachment to their email to their employees, they say neither the NPFAA, that's the no funds for public, no public funds for abortions, nor the Dobbs decision impacts or alters existing laws relating to birth control or contraception. So their respective attorneys interpret these Idaho laws differently. Bottom line, emergency contraception is no longer available at Idaho's public universities. Boise State will still provide birth control. University of Idaho will not other than condoms for STDs, based on the unclear wording of a law that dates back to the 19th century. Okay, so all of that is just an illustration of just how many abortion dominoes have fallen in Idaho, both before and since the Dobbs decision, and how many layers there are to this issue, including this question from JT, who wants to know about Idaho's participation in Whammy. That would be the medical school cohort, which includes Washington, Wyoming, Alaska, Montana, and Idaho. Whammy. Since Idaho and all those other states listed there other than Washington, well, they don't have a medical school. So they all send their medical students to the University of Washington to learn. Whammy teaches reproductive health care, JT says, and has various residencies throughout the five states and more. And those residents do an OBGYN rotation, which would include abortions. Is the state of Idaho going to pull out of Whammy, JT asks. What about the college 
the new College of Idaho, Idaho College of Medicine, excuse me. Their residents will also do an OBGYN rotation and perform abortions, and provide reproductive health care. Are we going to close ICOM? Okay, so there's a lot to unpack there, but it basically comes down to this, JT. We called the whammy office at the University of Idaho, and we were told there is no OBGYN residency within the state of Idaho. So any medical student wanting to go down that path to get an OBGYN rotation, well, they already have to go out of state anyway to get one. So if I understand your question correctly, the abortion laws in the state should not impact medical students going to other states. All right, you know, it's that time of year when people start to get a little more critical of their elected officials. No surprise, general election, just a little more than a month away. And if you want your voice heard, lawmakers actually want to hear it through a vote on the November ballot, which prompted this viewer question from PJ. A lot of initials today in our viewer questions. What is this showing up on my absentee ballot, said PJ. I thought the legislature already made its decision. Are they asking voters to change that decision? And this is what PJ is referring to, and this is what it looks like on the ballot. Short answer is... No, they're not asking you to change that. They're, they're, she's talking about this special session where lawmakers passed tax rebates, lowering the income tax rate and pushed more dollars to Idaho public schools. The advisory question that is on the ballot is just Idaho lawmakers asking for public opinion. So you get to tell them if they, well, did a good job or not. It's how the question is phrased, though, that has a lot of people talking online. Here's Andrew Bartline. A proud North Idaho resident, better described as a skeptic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. Aaron Reed stays up to date to stay informed. Read lots of news, listen to a lot of political commentators. He doesn't pledge a belief to one side. Cards on the table. I'm not a fan of either the Republican or the Democratic parties. But he does find common ground to the right. As far as values, I lean conservative. Which is why Reed generally approves of the 2022 special session where Governor Brad Little called lawmakers to the state house to pass $500 million in one-time tax rebates to lower the state income tax rate to funnel $410 million to Idaho public schools. Give him money back to the taxpayer when there's a surplus. Uh, I'm, I'm okay with that. What he's not okay with is the advisory question on the 2022 general election ballot. The wording was very leading. The advisory question is non-binding. It makes no legal changes but it's a tool for lawmakers to gauge public opinion. It reads, do you approve or disapprove of the state of Idaho using the record budget surplus to refund 500 million back to the hardworking Idaho taxpayers cut ongoing income taxes by more than 150 million and put more money into our classrooms by increasing education and student funding by a record 410 million. Your approval would combat historic inflation. By turning money to taxpayers, creating a simple flat tax, and making the single largest investment in public education in Idaho history. It's very guiding language, and it doesn't have any 
any part to play on a ballot. And it doesn't have a spot in Jeff Lyons' research. I will say that that's not how I would write a question if I was doing a survey and I wanted to say know what the public thought about this. Lyons is an associate professor of political science at Boise State University. But the language basically sort of gives the positives or the upsides to um, the tax cuts and the investments that are being made, but it doesn't discuss any alternatives or possible downsides. So because of that, I think you could definitely say that it's leading the respondents, or in this case, it's leading the voters to say that they support it. So who wrote the advisory question? The same people who wrote the law. The final page of House Bill 1 says lawmakers want to be responsive to what people want. The bill specifically frames the advisory question word by word for the upcoming ballot. But Lyons says there's likely a different motivation. The way that the question is worded is probably going to overstate support, right, since it's worded in kind of a favorable fashion. So my guess is that it primarily is used by lawmakers who were in favor of this legislation to sort of um, talk about the successes of the legislation that they passed and to say things like, you know, X number of Idahoans support the kind of work that I've been doing. Lyons says politicians have always found ways to favorably present their work. He says this is just another way for politicians to push themselves up and it's nothing new. My guess is that it largely is, doesn't impact a whole lot. But much like the data that will likely come out of the vote, Reed feels misled. That's the problem. Give us the cold hard facts don't use leading language. Professor Lyons says the advisory vote, uh, advisory votes are not very common in Idaho or really in any other state that has a strong ballot initiative process. And this question has sparked a lot of discussion online, which is kind of how it came across mm -hmm. our way. A lot of people making jokes about it, like, what if I am a taxpayer, but I'm not hardworking? Like there's language <laughs> there's in language. it to where, yeah. yeah. So. Do you like money and do you like kids? Check yes. Pretty much, that's yeah. what it comes out to. Okay, so it is about the referencing the language used to kind of say, hey, we did a good job, right? Well, you get a really good number, yeah. and then you can use that when you're up for election again and say 90% of people or whatever the number comes out to approved of whatever I chose to do. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for paying attention to the details, Andrew.
All right, time for the comments you sent in during today's show. We've got a few technical difficulties. Not going to be able to show them on the big board today, so I'll just read them to you. So bear with me here. Is this one uh, sent in? Uh, don't have a name on this one, but how can we trust the mayor when one day she says the chief had followed policy and the next she is asking him to resign? To resign, Mayor McLean has lost my trust, says that person there. This one from Mike. Why would you ask Hallie Burton any question regarding Boise police since he and Sanchez both voted to defund Boise police during the George, George Floyd cluster? Ask a council member that actually has a clue what Boise police does for our city. Well, I'm sure a lot of it has to do with maybe he was the only one available to speak to us today or really willing to speak with us today. It kind of happens that way. And isn't his view of this situation just as valuable as anyone else's since they're both involved with, well, Boise police. Regardless of how it is worded, this is in reference to the uh, question on the ballot coming up in the general election. Regardless of how it is worded, it has no place being on a ballot. Isn't that what Survey Monkey is for, says Jeannie in Boise. And this one from Ron. Me proud live in Idaho. Me master of cave. Wife cook, clean, make babies, nose place. We'll see you tomorrow.